Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thank goodness it's Friday. I hope everybody, and I've truly, truly been this, has had the most productive week that your future self will be groveling at your current self's feet for, for the rest of their lives. That's what we call productivity, baby. Um, personally, I had uh, an amazing week. My per personal production level, uh, this was the best week I've had uh, all year. Um, nothing crazy happened that, that I can say, hey man, you know what? I'm going to share this with you guys. No, nothing like that, but definitely what I've been doing is working much harder. I don't know if you guys seen the clip from uh, this previous Celebrity Sunday. The difference between good and great it is underestimated by most humans. If you good and you just wake up and be good, you ain't, you're not gonna beat me. You're never and gonna beat me if you're not like, like. We can all wake up and be talented and good, but it's not going to beat great. So we want to be great so we can afford things beyond our wildest dreams and do things beyond our wildest dreams. It's not always about things that we're able to afford. It's always about compartmentalizing and being able to enjoy life. And, you know, I ran across a quote from a video that I saw, which is you only live once, but if you do it right, once is enough. So, you know, everything that I could think of, you know, that can keep me motivated and, and elevated, not, not just, just motivated, but elevated, man, I feel like I've gotten, you know, a handful of those things like in recent uh, weeks. And I'm definitely happy to share it with you guys, but that's pretty much all we're gonna do with opening the video. Um, <laughs> so look, I have an amazing property that we're going to see. Uh, if anyone knows, I truly, truly love uh, things that represent Zen, right? We've seen, you know, an amazing Zen-like house in Encino, and it just, you know, it 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 definitely uh, opened my eyes to, you know, what what I may truly be looking for now. Like I said before, I still want to live by a body of water. So these compounds that you can have, you can put a body of water, not a swimming pool, but like pond, right? Something like a koi pond, you know, just, just give me something where I can be at peace with nature, you know, on a daily basis where I may have to like think and reflect. So we're going to look at a uh, Japanese inspired home that was built in the 30s and I mean it's it's a mansion up in you know in the Bay Area so we're gonna check it out the video is from uh, Architectural Digest so it'll be a very like educational video I guess per per se you know in terms of elements and materials used and stuff like that and as you know that's been a very uh, beneficial factor to me to listen and learn so i probably won't talk as much which is probably a good thing for for you guys the viewer because i know sometimes i ramble on a lot but when i'm learning I keep my mouth shut because that's what you got to do you know you 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 gotta when you when someone is dropping information to you you need to be able to receive that message so we're going to listen and we're going to appreciate uh, this beautiful uh, mansion and I'll tell you guys if it's sold or not and you know all that stuff at the end of the video if you're interested in that type of thing. Let's go. I'd like to welcome you to Quail Hill located at 21 Canyon Road, Ross, California. I'm Neil Ward with Compass Real Estate. This property is made up of 20 acres, high up on the ridge, secluded and private. It would be almost impossible to acquire anything close to this. The home itself is made up 
of 11,500 square feet. It's a hybrid of Japanese and contemporary architecture. Six bedrooms, each with their own baths, formal dining room, formal living room, grand music room. The main entrance gallery is 150 feet long. All of the rooms look out and are surrounded by beautiful Japanese gardens. The home is currently on the market for $29 million. I like what I see so far. It looks... I'm standing here with Mark Very Pomeroy, who is the understated. son of Mr. and Mrs. Pomeroy, who built this wonderful property. So the story of this property is quite interesting. My father acquired it in 1969. It was 21 acres, and he had the desire to build a Japanese home was rather unusual 50 years ago and he had a vision of a large space that could be used for family entertaining with multiple gardens and it was very important to bring the exterior interior broke ground september 6 1969 and completed october 9 1970 so it was a very quick build considering the amount of earth that was moved and the concrete that was poured it was uh, 1700 cubic yards of concrete on the foundation <laughs> so it's quite a it's not going to go anywhere it was important for the architect to have a contemporary chandelier in the space. So what we did to get the correct scale, my father and I actually bought chicken wire and actually made a mock-up scale to see what worked right. I think we did three versions and this seemed to be them that worked the most. Obviously with the slate floor and a lot of the glass in the home, it was important to have a softening to this wall with its length and width. And so my mother was very interested in visiting the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and a lot of the rooms were upholstered walls. So she actually brought out a team that had upholstered walls in some of the galleries, and they found this sort of chamois color velvet. And if you notice the detailing, the welting work, I think it took almost three and a half weeks to upholster wow, these walls. Wow, And they're all padded. They're very a soft padding Thermostat. behind. And the thing that's remarkable, when you think this house is 52 years old and these walls are pristine, impeccable, have really not changed, just slight fading where paintings have been hung, all the wall coverings in the house are original. And they've never been touched. We're now standing in the main living room to the house. And as you can see, it has beautiful 13 foot high ceilings, wonderful scale, wonderful volume. And then looking out to just the most serene, beautiful landscape imaginable. You'll notice yeah, in the dining insane. room, the living room, and the music room, the next room, is that there are Claire Story windows. I call it a double roof system. And it was important for the architect to bring additional light in. There are also very deep eaves that go out, which keep the house very cool in the summertime. The scale is unusual for the era. In 1970, yeah. homes were really not quite this large and with both the scale and it was something very important to my parents. They wanted space. And this room will always be very special to me because this is where we'd have our Christmas tree. They went up to the ceiling and in the 1940s, my father was in Belgium and he bought glass ornaments that are the size of basketballs and we had them hung in the tree and we still have them and it's a wonderful tradition. You look Definitely at the railings has here. Tokyo my vibes. grandfather came to San Francisco in 1933 for a large contract to build the Golden Gate Bridge. So, in homage to the bridge, my father decided to paint the railings international orange, which is the color of the Golden Gate Bridge. Here we are in the formal dining room of the house we just came across from the living room and there has to be some wonderful stories that happened in here. The dining room was designed to take advantage of this lovely courtyard garden, and the uh, room across from here was my father's library, and there's shoji screens, which would be pulled closed in the evening, and then the room backlit. So when you're sitting in here, you really had a, a very sense of being in a, in a temple setting in Japan. Yeah, One it thing, looks like uh, it. interesting sourcing 100%. when the house was being built, there was a wonderful craftsman in San Francisco by the name of Dirk Van Erp. He was a wonderful metal worker. These uh, sketches he Dirk designed, Van which Erp. are a copy of the imperial chrysanthemum, and these were pulls some of the closets and my parents were very important for them to have storage everywhere they wanted ease of access all the silver all the crystal all the tableware all the table linens were all here the thing that's quite amazing once again is 52 years later not a spot on any of this it's just really quite extraordinary wow. 
guys kept it clean. Did you guys even play in that house? Adjacent to the formal dining room, we're in the central courtyard. This is a very Still special clean. garden once again because we have the dining room vistas, we have the music room vistas, we have the library vistas, all centered on this space. This garden was designed by Nagao Sakurai, who was the first graduate from the University of Tokyo in landscape architecture. And for 20 years, he was chief custodian of the Imperial Gardens at the palace in Tokyo. So, so he came here and actually authentic. designed this garden. Authentic I think artisan. he spent about three or four days just contemplating the spaces. And he would recite haiku of what he envisioned and what the spirits were telling him about the garden. And the thing that I love about this garden, which you'll see as you move through the courtyards, is that these gardens have a four season cycle. Our family were always grillers and barbecuers. So barbecue is a very key element, but barbecues are not usually that attractive. So the architect said, well, why don't we build some type of very traditional Japanese structure over the barbecue? He came up with this design, which is a copy of a Shinto shrine. There are metal grates inside, uh, hydraulic lifts that go up and down to lower the fire. There were gas jets to light the charcoal. We took barbecuing to <laughs> <laughs> the edge of limit. This is, was a great entertaining spot. We'd have cocktails out here. These poles were actually telephone poles. They couldn't find anything substantial enough for the posting. And they were taken to a lathe in Berkeley and shaped to this size. And then you notice that they all have a copper ankle bracelets to prevent water damage. This actually was re-roofed probably seven years ago. Wonderful Japanese artisan that did this by himself. He took all the old shingles off. He took the cross members off himself. All the nailings are copper nails. Very traditional. This was approached, this is a traditional Shinto shrine and we will treat it as such. This was originally the music room. My father played the organ and he had a very, very large organ here. All the walls are upholstered in, in white linen and original linen. Linen allowed the sound to come out and it gave it a very melodious sort of soft tone to the organ music. I think an interesting note to this is if you look at the exterior of the house, it's white plaster and dark stain. We've brought that into this room with the white linen walls and the dark staining. So we've really brought the outside in. And I think it's a wonderful juxtaposition. And this was sort of the family gathering room it was always my favorite room in the house. When the house was being designed, my parents did not like forced air heating. They didn't like the sound of air whooshing through spaces. So they instructed the architect to design the home with radiant heat. And radiant heat is oftentimes found only in floors. But the uh, mechanical engineer said the actual home should have radiant heat in the ceilings because the sun, what does it do? It radiates down on you doesn't radiate up. So all of the ceilings have serpentine of copper piping throughout all the ceilings to radiate the heat down. In the main slate hallway and in all the bathrooms, they put the radiant heat in the floors as well so it would warm up in cold mornings and it's the cleanest heat possible. This house does not look like it's been updated in a very long time. After leaving the music room, walking down the hall, we're now entering the study library. This was my father's study, and he would read if they had his books here. It was built in television and stereo, so he was very comfortable here, especially on Sunday afternoons watching football. This has a unique ceiling. It's a pitch ceiling. It's the only pitch ceiling in the house. All the paneling is very fine grain oak. There's a guest room that's situated behind this room, so this could actually be a living area for the guest room as well. So it's very well thought out. Once again, to bring the Asian element, these are obviously shoji screens. They do open all out and close the room completely off. The uh, surround is slate, once again, tying in the slate in the hallways and the exterior. Very sober mantelpiece. This was my father's favorite room. Hey, we're at the bar right here. This so is this is the bar. epicenter of the house. Who, who would not want a bar in the 60s? This bar has so much activity, great fun spots, center of the house, wonderful cocktails are made here. And once again, the original wallpaper, the, the bar. original appliances. Many more glasses, a lot more alcohol, but it's still a fun place to be. Now we're walking into the primary the bathroom suite needs and to be updated. as with the rest of the home, every aspect of this property was incredibly well thought out. We're now back to the back of the home where it's quiet, 
private. You feel like you're in a forest here with views up to Mount Tam, down to the city of San Francisco. So this was my parents' bedroom, and the design was they wanted it to be a treehouse. And actually this floor plan juts out and it's built on very high pilings. So they really were in the trees, which was very important. This was very tranquil with the private entry hall that this was their domain away from the children's rooms. Lovely walk-in closet for my mother and lots of built-ins. My mother in her later years would spend most of her day in this room and just loved the light and, and the views to the mountains. on the other side of the I house, separate this area. and private. Oh my goodness, this is, yeah. You just walk your property and this is outstanding in terms of the nature, nature aspect, the nature, the Zen. This is, this is everything that Zen represents are the four guest bedrooms. Each of the guest bedrooms has its own walk-in closet and own bath. I have uh, identical twin sisters and my parents built identical rooms for them where they shared a Jack and Jill bathroom. It speaks so much to the symmetry of the home. The home was built about on function. Everything is located where it should be. There's no unnecessary movement. Everything is where it should be, when it should be. Jack As you can see, Jill. all these rooms have either courtyard garden views or mountain views and also borrowed space. I'm borrowing this space from that room, and I'm borrowing this space from that room. It's, that was very key to the whole design of this house. Coming back down the hallway, now we're gonna go into my room, which I think is the best one. Original draperies from 1970. The colors are pretty wild, but that was back in the 70s. My uh, dressing room, you'll notice the walls are blue and white stripe. Once again, 1970 originals, and still look as white as it was the day they were put up. All of the guest bedrooms have doors that open up to the outside and look from one room into the next. It's very open, but very private, which is, I think, quite unique. I think the only thing we ain't seen is, the, is really Let's the kitchen. Let's move on down the hallway to the wonderful cemetery. I mean, we did look at that gardens the whole time. Gardens. So Which are these wonderful. two gardens are quite interesting. So this is a dry riverbed. And as it passes under this glass bridge, it is suddenly transformed into actual running water and it cascades over these rocks and then down into two ponds below this exterior bridge. So it was a wonderful sort of transition from the public to the private. And this glass bridge really allows you to take in so many wonderful vistas. Sound and light is a, an important element of this house. From every area you hear sounds, whether it be a morning dove up in the eaves make, giving a call in the late afternoon, or the sound of water. This door, when my parents lived here, was open all year long. It is something that I will have in my head forever. It's something very deep, and it ties into the whole Japanese mentality of resourcing water and life and the cycle of life. So, so let's go outside. You're doing an open house, All you leave that door open. have been trimmed. We have an arborist that comes yearly. We also have a French arborist who trims all the maples and the pine trees. The Smithsonian had the, uh, all the gardens photographed and they actually are in their archives. It's very rare to have Japanese gardens today, A, because of the maintenance and also the design. They felt it was very important to record that for posterity because so many gardens, unless they're public gardens, are no longer uh, accessible or even Japanese gardens anymore. It was an honor and I think uh, the garden represents so much of the Japanese design taste and really a recognition of Sakurai who is a, a masterful landscape architect. You'll notice the, the rafters, the detailing here. All this is original, it's never been restained. And I think something I like, especially, is the shadowing in this house. With all of the, uh, the lines, you get tremendous shadowing and detailing and display on the bottoms of the walls. It's quite special. Against the home itself, there are copper downspouts, but the architect didn't want some massive piece of metal here. So the idea of just the chain, so the water will roll around the chain link into the pond. So it's an interesting artistic statement, but it also serves a, a wonderful purpose at the same time. So this was sort of the walkway from my parents' bedroom out to the pool. When we would have large parties, these <laughs> windows would all open and people would flow out onto the terraces. And we uh, also can drop down into this garden from here, some stepping stones to the basin there. 
As we leave the terrace coming out to the pool area, the views mark, oh my goodness, everywhere. This is a very, very special place. This was the first black bottom pool that was put in. And originally someone, they said, oh, it should be aqua colored. My father said, no, we want it to be more like a, a, a pond or, or somewhere that it's dark and it go, ties in with the roof of the darkness. My father wanted to sort of acknowledge the name of the property or the siding that it was Quail Hill. So a wonderful calligrapher came up and this is magnificent calligraphy. The symbol on the right means quail and the symbol on the left means hill or mountain. And then on the left is a signature of the artist. One thing you may have noticed as we walk through the property or the home is uh, minimal steps. When the home was designed, my mother was not initially 100% on board moving into a new home and leaving the home she, she loved so much. And she said, all right, Bob, there's one thing you have to agree to, no steps. So from the garage to my mother's bedroom, there's not one step. It just keeps that super zen feeling that there's no interruption. It's organic, but it's very, very designed. So it's interesting that she can be organic and super designed at the same time. So I think that's a very key element to this house. No kitchen. I'm, I'm Here we are at the front why? entrance to the home and adjacent this got to be super outdated sculpture mark. Uh, this is a, a kasuga in Japanese temples. It would be lit with a candle here. I think it's a, a very strong statement. My father wanted this statement at the front of the house to really give the sense that yes, this is Japan. This is authentic Japan. Welcome to our home. I think one of the key elements too with this lovely white stucco wall are these sculpted pine trees. All the trees were sourced from around California. The motif here are clouds. You can sense the idea of the clouds with the shapes here. One of the many extraordinary features of the home mark is this just magical special garden here that sets the tone as you come into the property. It's very true, Neil. I think the thing that's interesting to it, it's when you compare this garden to the other courtyard gardens, this is the largest garden. And it's a garden that has wonderful change of season in it. You're going to this garden, and, you know, the door may be open towards the pool and you're looking out to the vistas. It's very serene and you almost feel that you are crossing a bridge and a bridge into a new world. And when the doors are wide open, it, it's just a very inviting space. Mark, it's incredible to believe that we are minutes from the city, but yet when you're here, it's so quiet and private. We're up on this magical ridge looking out to vistas that are just extraordinarily special. That's massive. My father had the idea of building a Japanese home, as I perhaps mentioned. So he found this fantastic architect, Mitsuru Tada, who has remained very close to us and still comes out to see the property. And my father said, well, I would like a living room, a music room, six bedrooms, a guest room, and a study. So Mitsuru goes to his office and creates his watercolor. So if you actually look at this and we're in the house, very similar. We have our garages here. We have our front entry hall here. We have the living room where we are now. This is the music room. We have the library and the guest room here. And then we have the private family wing here. So quite extraordinary that very little deviation from this original schematic. And there was no floor plan yet. He just did this on the top of his head, that this is basically the house today. Mark, thank you so much for sharing such special moments throughout the building of the house, your family, everything that's gone into this. Thank you so much. Well, Neil, you're welcome. It's, it was my pleasure to come. The home uh, has meant a great deal to me f for 50 years, and I love sharing stories about it because it has such a rich personality and so much character to it. And as I keep saying, integrity. So uh, it was my pleasure, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, the audience will enjoy a, a, a glimpse into Japan uh, in California. So we did not see the kitchen because it's outdated. I, I'm, I got money saying Thank that the kitchen's Thank you so much for outdated. joining us outdated. on the tour of Quail Hill, located at 21 Canyon Road, just minutes from San Francisco, right across the Golden Gate Bridge. Quail Hill represents such a unique opportunity to own something of such scale and grandeur that would almost never be available again on the market for $29 million. I'm Neil Ward, with Compass Real Estate San Francisco.
thank you so much. And you know what's funny? Uh, Compass Real This is the house that we looked at, uh, but we got the tour from Ryan and, uh, and Enos. We got the tour from Ryan and Enos. Huh. It's just, it's insane. All right, so before uh, I tell you guys what happened to the property, let's look at a couple of quick comments and uh you know we'll 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 go from there all right Ooh, okay <laughs> the homeowner uh giving the tour makes it sentimental you can tell he enjoyed the house for years Ab absolutely I, I agree can you imagine growing up in such a beautiful home some people are so lucky what a beautiful place i hope whoever gets the home inland does not change a thing walking through the grounds it must be a dream so glad i got to see this I agree that nothing should be changed in terms of the aesthetics, you know, outdoors, you know, or uh, like the gardening or in anything like that. The grounds, all of that should not be changed, but the place does need some updating in terms of uh, the kitchen and bathrooms. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the house is the first house to make me wish I was wealthy enough to both buy and maintain the house. It feels so safe and warm to the point it feels euphoric. It is also the first house that doesn't make me want to remodel stuff. Okay, I, I you know you're, everyone is entitled to whatever it is they like. Me personally, the only thing like I said I would change is really the the kitchen that we didn't get to see and the the bathrooms. Um, the owners were visionaries. What a masterpiece. I find it impossible to let go if I was the son. Well, the reality is, is this, and I'm sure he doesn't really want to let it go, but when a home is left in a trust, there basically are a group of people, you know, in the family, however many that is. It could just be the children, could be, you know, other relatives involved. But typically what happens is in order for the property to be either held or sold, that has to be a decision that they come together with. And usually, of course, the majority outweighs the few. And that's actually how it works. So you could be legally forced to sell something if the majority of the of the family are the members of the trust in general, because members of the trust don't necessarily have to be family decide that they want to sell you don't really have a vote you will get your proceeds once the, the home is sold and you know that that is that okay so now we're looking at the listing of the property and as you can see the property has since been sold or changed hands but i'll explain uh, a little bit exactly what happened after we look at the, the pictures um just to see if we can if if the, if the kitchen was there or not because man this this just being secluded like this feels so organic and it's like they brought in a lot of the the trees and stuff so we know it's not true organic architecture but it technically is because i mean look uh if you took this away there's going to be so much left behind that is of nature but this is not true organic architecture in, in, in the true sense, but it feels organic. Like, like he said, it's like a combination of both because it does, this does feel organic. Man, this, this house looks amazing from like just, just every scale. I love the uh, aesthetics of the property, like the architecture of the property. This is just beautiful, right? This is beautiful. Like it's, it's got some old mid-century modern, but it's really, really layered with Japanese inspiration, like true Japanese inspiration, right? You can even look at like the, the, the darkness of the wood and the paneling. It's just really, it's, re it's really nice. That was that living area. Right, there's, there's a deck there, there's like a dining area. You have the piano. <laughs> piano. This is that dining room. Um, 
you know this picture the video this looks better in the video than it does in the picture so obviously the picture is going to be you know edited in a certain way where the colors pop out more than what you actually would see with your own retinas so you know man <laughs> Cause like this, this, I don't like it like this. I liked it the way it looked in the video. But man, this just feels so quaint and so like you're, you're eating at the most exclusive place in Japan, right? One of these like private, you know, Michelin star restaurants is in your dining is at your house and in, in, you know in your own dining room and then you eat outside obviously they have the the barbecue uh area like this is this is remarkable wow like this is just all like beautiful you walk the ground you walk through the house you feel peace it's just amazing yeah see to be honest with you the bar the bar counters i could live with the bar counters like and this, these are, this is like laminate. This is not even like high quality stuff. At the time, laminate was a good quality material. Um, as far as like stones, you know, granite and, and things like that, especially in like in the thirties, fifties, though, you know, those were not materials that were typically used at all, right? These are all current. Right. So what I'm saying is current what, what we currently like. Right. Laminate is super cheap to make now. At that point, the process was still new. So it was a more expensive uh, type of material to use over things like tile. It's just an amazing spot. For, for a house to be up top and then like just all of the rooms are connected to grounds, right? They're just all connected to grounds. Like you don't have to walk in the hallways. You could just walk through the grounds and get to where you want to get to. It's just, it's just like an experience. This house is an experience. So yeah, we, no kitchen, no kitchen. And, and look, the kitchen, the kitchen was here off of, um, is this the driveway? Wow, there's a staff of bedroom. Okay. Uh, but yeah, this is the, this was the entryway. Then you had the living room, the dining room and goes through here to the the kitchen the butler's pantry so we didn't see the kitchen at all right we didn't see the kitchen at all <laughs> so the kitchen must not be a selling point uh, of the house which is the reason why i said uh, i'm i'm sure it's outdated i'm sure it's outdated right i'm a hundred percent sure it's outdated but yeah uh, uh other than updating for for me other than updating it, uh, you know, in terms of the, the kitchen, the kitchen, the, the bathrooms, I wouldn't do a single thing to that place at all. This, this is like the most unique, beautiful, where it's not like, it's a huge unique design where it's like pop out in your face, like something Robert O'Shatz would do, um, which is, if you didn't see that video, that was the, the last uh, video where we looked at his uh, home, which is built on a hill. True organic architecture. Lovely, lovely house. If you haven't seen it, you don't have to look at my video. You can look at Architectural Digest's uh, video. Amazing. Like, mind-blowing. Um, and then the story behind it was even better. Back to, <laughs> back to this beautiful... Japanese contemporary mid-century modern type of home and at the at the time that this was built contemporary would have been mid-century modern so we today we call it mid-century modern because of when it was built 
in the middle of the century, right? <laughs> of, 19, of 1900, right? So that's kind of what we would describe. It was a particular style that was contemporary uh, for the time. So this is like co a combination of mid-century modern with Japanese uh, architecture along with Japanese inspired grounds. Beautiful combination. I think this will be really, really hard to duplicate but it's definitely, for me right now, this is kind of like a dream style of house that I would prefer. Not like the, the beautiful moderns of today. I would prefer something like this, like like just, just this. So back to what happened to the property. Um, <laughs> back to what happened to the property. Uh, it was unsold. Right. When, when, when was that? When was it on the originally on the market? 2021. Right. No, 2020 it is on, you know, originally listed in 2020 for forty three million dollars. OK. It was originally listed for for forty three million dollars, then came down to twenty nine, which is a far cry from the forty three. I mean, it's fourteen million dollar difference. Then they dropped it down to twenty. And what ended up happening is they were able to, because the house is still in the family, by the way. I know I'm, I'm get, was getting ready to mention him uh, that they found a way to keep it in, you know, in the family. Uh, the house is still in the family, so they found a way to bring a deal together where they could buy out the share. And every, you know, everyone who wanted to sell was able to leave happy. So that is what happened to the property. So the property is still in the Poromoy family, which to me is good because I think really they're the only ones that could appreciate the house. Um, you know, whoever st still ends up having it, whether it's one of the Poromoys or you know a few different uh, of them. I think they're the only ones that could really appreciate this house because I, I feel like someone, I really do feel like someone really would have came in there, uh, you know, probably at a $18 million mark or something like that, or, you know, 16 million. I, who knows? Who knows the number that someone would have eventually paid for this? Because I do feel like this is a house that would eventually sell. Uh, I don't know what the other properties in the area typically sell for. I did look around just a tad, just to kind of see. And yeah, they were way on the higher side, especially at that 43 than anything that, that had sold. I, this house, if had it, you know, had it sold, even at that $29 million mark would have been a record for that area. But it is a multi-million dollar home area. So it's not like they just astronomically made something up. And, you know, it's just like, where did that come from? It is a unique property. And sometimes, you know, when you have something like this, you can't really comp it to other things because there is no other house that looks like that in the area. So I, I understand that aspect, but yes, the home did stay in the family and it's currently off the market who knows if they'll decide to possibly sell it sell it again who knows but for now the property remains in the family and that's the end uh, of the story to a much a very very beautiful house a very very beautiful house so yeah I hope uh, you guys enjoyed that video. I know personally I did, and you know we'll 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 set up something for uh, for Sunday. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if this is the permanent schedule, but I'm trying to remain uh, consistent in my productivity. So for now, I'm doing my best to put a video out Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. So. I'm going to wrap this one up and I'll see you guys on the next one. Peace.